Hello and welcome to the Reasons I'm Broke podcast, bringing you the reasons we're broke, ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. I'm Kelly. And I'm Daniel. And this week's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Sign up today and get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash nerdupmedia. There is over 150,000 titles to choose from, all available on your Android device, Kindle, or iPhone. For any new listeners out there, welcome to the BroCat family. The way we do the show is we cover news first. That's usually about half of the episode, ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. And usually the last half of the podcast is actually consists of comic book reviews. And we're going to jump right into our news, some video game news first. A new character has been revealed for Tekken 7 that has created controversy among gamers and the game director, Kashira Harada. The new character, Lucky Chloe, was revealed during an event on Monday morning to commemorate 20 years of Tekken. Western gamers. You guys. Oh, you Western (laughs) gamers. (laughs) They felt her design was unimaginative and generic compared to the rest of the cast of the Tekken characters. Someone pointed it out perfectly. The way this character looks is she's essentially a sort of just a regular girl but she has like animal features to her not as if it's part of her body but she's actually almost like a cosplay it looks like those girls who go to the conventions that don't dress as a character but they just dress in all the cutesy things to be cute and have boys look at them that's what she looks like yeah and people took issue with her and (laughs) Some of the things that gamers have been saying, they've called her an abomination, and that's when uh, Harada went on Twitter to defend his game's character. (laughs) This is the best Twitter thing I've ever seen, ever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, at Harada underscore Tekken wrote, because you don't need that character, right? It's a simple thing. I'll release another character for you guys. Example, looks well-muscled, skinhead, and very powerful attack. I don't like this idea, but if you need this. Calm down and don't worry. That character, Lucky Chloe, is an East Asia and Europe exclusive. (laughs) So he went, okay, you babies, I'll give you something else then. Like, not only that, but he was like kind of an asshole back about it. Like, he's like, no, 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 this is what we're going to give you. This generic fucking character that Western gamers seem to enjoy. Like some skinhead, he's going to be real big, and that's what you guys like, right? Just based on all the games that you play. I'm like, holy shit, he got really upset about this. <laughs> he went on to add that the Western character would fight MMA style and carry a gun. <laughs> Brilliant. They're going to make it the most... It's, it's going to be... He's so upset about the way people have been talking about this new character. And it's going to end up making a wacky character in itself <laughs> that may fit really well in Tekken. <laughs> and... Uh, all of us are going to be like, yeah, that was it. This is the best character you've ever released. And he's going to be like, I just pretty much made a shit character. Yeah, I don't see how gamers can really get that upset about any of the characters that they put in a Tekken game. I mean, this is a series that has had pandas and dinosaurs That's as amazing. fighters. Those are great characters. Are you kidding me? Amazing. <laughs> Let me choose my T-Rex over here. And on top of that, too, is you don't have to play as Lucky Chloe at all. You can pick any of the other great characters. Well, she's in my game, though. (laughs) That is the way they act. But we're not getting her, so (laughs) maybe they'll bring her out as DLC later. But now, now that he said this, if you look at the threads, people are saying, well, can you make it an optional thing, maybe? Like, now they've immediately backed (laughs) off and been like, whoa, whoa. Whoa, sorry, sir. And he's going to be like, no, no women anymore, ever. He acted as I think he should have. Mm. Like, just be, you know what? Nope. No character. It's gone. You guys don't get it. Well, no, we didn't want her gone. Yeah, you did. Like, all the shit that you said about her. It's like kids on the playground. That's exactly what happened. Like, they complained about something, so the teacher's like, nope, no more. And they're like, well, I mean, we could still have applesauce. Is he justifying them complaining by removing the character? No, I don't think so. I think he's showing them what babies they're being. Well, you know, there's going to be some people that are going to say... Well, good thing we complained, because now that character is gone, and we're going to get someone new. But this whole thing about this generic character, MMA style, probably went completely over their head, and they're oh, like, I'm oh, sure. yeah, that'll be great. I'm sure. <laughs> for the, I mean, for the people who are smart enough to get it, they get it. Right. Staying on the video game news, the first ever Game Awards 
and it is going to be an annual thing, so 2014's, it served as a platform to highlight this year's greatest games and to showcase some heavy hitters for 2015. And we have a list of some of the winners here. Mm -hmm. First up, Best Indie Game went to Shovel Knight for the 3DS, Wii U, PC, and Mac. Shovel Knight is a very popular game. If you remember a couple of episodes back, Josh from Tales from the Game Grid said that this would be a great character in a Super Smash Brothers game and went on to compliment, compliment the entire indie development of the, of the game because it was a lot of fun. It's kind of like a mix of Uncle Scrooge in which you can jump on enemies and mm. then like a regular pixelated 2D platformer. It, was, it looks like a really fun game and apparently everyone else thought so too. That's awesome. The best shooter went to Far Cry 4, which was for the PC, PS3, PS4, Xbox 360, and Xbox One. Far Cry 4 beat out Call of Duty, Advanced Warfare, Destiny, Titanfall, and Wolfenstein New Order. Wolfenstein. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you say it. It's the best name ever, Wolfenstein. You think they should have won based on the name alone? Yes, absolutely. The, you can judge a game by its name. <laughs> Best sports or racing game went to Mario Kart 8 for the Wii U. Good job, Mario Kart. The other nominees in this category were FIFA 15, Forza Horizon 2, NBA 2K15, and Trials Fusion. Good job, Nintendo. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the only thing that they won. We're actually getting to the next one. Yes, Developer of the Year, Nintendo. That's right. They did win Developer of the Year. I always say when you buy a Nintendo console, you're buying it for the first party games. And this is the example right here, Nintendo. Mm -hmm. They're putting out these. Uh, they had a great year, 2014. Sales-wise, it obviously could be way better, but these games have been awesome. They got the exclusive with Bayonetta 2. They got Smash Brothers, Mario Kart, and more stuff on the way, Pokemans. which we will cover. And your Pokemon yes, games. Pokemans. Exactly. And they're probably working on a Pokemon Snap. Let's just be real. Best fighting game also went to Nintendo with Super Smash Brothers on the Wii U. Did Nintendo put on this uh, Game Awards? Did, did they fund this Game Awards? <laughs> no, but Reggie was a big part of it as uh, far as like I'm sort of a co-host almost. I'm pretty sure they funded these Game Awards. They just gave, they gave uh, Jeff Keighley they're, enough money? They're like, they're, as they're sliding a briefcase of money across the table, they're like, so who's in the running? <laughs> To be fair, fighting game, I mean, it didn't have that much competition. It's Super Smash Brothers, whatever year it comes out. And unless there's a Street Fighter game that comes out that same year or Mortal Kombat, it's going to go to Smash. Mario Kart was the bigger surprise for mm -hmm. me because you did have stuff like FIFA and 2K15 as a uh, competition. Next up is Best Mobile Game, which went to Hearthstone, which is for PC, iPad, iPhone, and Android. Huge title. Most people I work with are playing that game. I don't even know. My what brother's it is. playing that game. <laughs> people tell me to play Soda Crush Saga and the Kim Kardashian game. <laughs> That's what my friends are playing. Well, I'm glad those didn't win. And I'm not gonna lie, I kind of want to play the Kim Kardashian game. Oh, geez, don't contribute to that, please. She, she makes me feel good about herself. <laughs> I get to learn how to be cool like her. <laughs> Maybe I'll meet Kanye West and we can fall in love. Oh, yeah. They're all awesome people and definitely someone you should aspire to. <laughs> I'm going to keep going here and pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> Best musical score went to Destiny for the PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, Xbox 360, and the Xbox One. The other nominees in this category were Alien Isolation, Child of Light, Sunset Overdrive, and the one you like the most, Transistor. I think that should have won Best Musical Score. I mean, the soundtrack alone is phenomenal. There's original music there, vocals, regular beats. Really, really good from Supergiant Games. You can listen to the entire soundtrack on YouTube. Just type in Transistor Soundtrack. They put it up themselves, and they're like, here you go. You can listen to it for free. And then if you want to own it, you can buy it here at this link. And I did, and it was really good. He listens to it every day. All the time. It's one of my favorite soundtracks. And I'm really, I'm sad that it didn't win, but, you know, I guess Destiny was better. Game of the Year went to Dragon Age Inquisition. Nominees for Bayonetta 2, Dark Souls 2, Hearthstone, and Shadow of Mordor. Spooky, Shadow of Mordor. I'm hearing great things about Dragon Age Inquisition. Uh, I think the runner-up would have been Shadow of Mordor. It went to Dragon Age, good for Bioware. I can't wait for the next Mass Effect game. But there you have it, the game of the year for the first ever video game award by Jeff Keighley. 
So also at the Game Awards, they gave out awards, but they also announced some wonderful new things. Zelda lead producer Eiji Anoma and Zelda creator Shigeru Miyamoto showed off some gameplay for 2015's open world Legend of Zelda game for the Wii U. I expected maybe some little bit of, maybe some screenshots for the new Star Fox game, something like that. But they brought out the big hitter, Legend of Zelda. Nintendo slid that briefcase of money across the table. The Game Awards took out half of it and said, what can you give us? Yeah. <laughs> and this is what happened. Way more footage than I expected. Mm -hmm. Epona automatically avoids trees to free up the player to navigate the map or to fire arrows at enemies. So the horse isn't dumb anymore. Usually, yeah, it would just continue, and then when it would neigh and jump up, that's when you know, oh, shit, I just hit a tree or something. <laughs> but now it controls it automatically for you, mm -hmm. and it's because it is an open-world game. You take the game pad, you choose where you want to go, and the opponent will take you there while you focus on enemies, on uh, where you may explore some other dungeons, where you're going to map up your next location, or, you know, even as you're working with your inventory. It's pretty awesome. The open world is also bigger than ever, as it will take players a good amount of time to reach areas in the game. The biggest news for me, Miyamoto revealed that Star Fox will release next year before The Legend of Zelda. Oh, wow. We've seen more footage for Zelda, yet Star Fox is going to be coming up hopefully in about eight months or so. I want them just to repackage all the N64 ones and be like, here you go. <laughs> I'd buy it. <laughs> I, like the, I like Star Fox 64 so much. Someone did say, why is Star Fox coming out before Zelda? Why isn't Zelda coming out first? Because then nobody will buy Star Fox because they're all buying Zelda. Exactly. Everyone's going to be way too preoccupied <laughs> Please, with people, Zelda. Please, people, like, pay attention to life. It's very similar to what happened with Super Smash Brothers. You bring it out on the 3DS first. That's the one that people are going to buy because they want Smash as soon as possible. Then you give them the best experience, which is the Wii U mm -hmm. version. Because now it's hard to look back at the 3DS version of Super Smash. I actually traded mine in today. Got rid of it. All I need is the Wii U version, and that's what I have. But now you can't customize your Me guy. Yeah, you can still on the Wii U. I really didn't see any need to keep the 3DS version. Yeah. Well... I connected both games using the gamepad and all of that and it just didn't do much for me mm. but i also didn't play the 3ds one a lot i unlocked all the characters played all the stages and then like i mentioned before i just couldn't do the controls on a handheld for a mm -hmm. game like super smash brothers so i waited for the wii u version and it was definitely better run smoother and that's it <laughs> So that does do it for our coverage of the Game Awards 2014. It was a great year. Hopefully next year will be just as wonderful. Next, we're going to move into our question of the week from last week. We asked you guys, what Disney worlds would you like to see in Kingdom Hearts 3? First answer is from Twitter, at Cage with a K023. For the Disney movies in Kingdom Hearts 3, I want Treasure Planet, Big Hero 6, and The Sword in the Stone. Those are all... Great choices. I actually think Treasure Planet would be really, really cool. Yeah, there's definitely a fan base for Treasure Planet. You mm. still hear that name come up all the time when people discuss some of the best animated Disney movies. Yeah, Big Hero Six. I would just cry. They would put it, and I would, I would start to cry. The other answer comes from Justin on Facebook. I would like to see Wreck It Ralph in Kingdom Hearts Three. That seems like the perfect fit. Mm -hmm. You have all the video game characters you can utilize. Wreck It Ralph and that world would lend itself really well to Kingdom Hearts and he would be like a really good strong character you know to replace Mickey or Donald or Goofy with. Mm -hmm. But let's be real we're gonna see Frozen. And we definitely will. And I'm gonna say come on Kingdom Hearts let it go and then we're all gonna laugh at my pun that everyone's sick of so we should just let that go too. <laughs> <laughs> And that will do it for our video game news. We can move into some Godzilla stuff. Mm -hmm. So 10 years after Godzilla Final Wars, production company Toho will be creating a new Godzilla movie for release in 2016. This is really exciting. The franchise was put on hold after Final Wars brought in only $12 million. But with 2014's Godzilla breathing new life into the franchise with $525 million, <sighs> Toko, Toho has decided that it was time to do a re reboot of their own. So Toho went, look, they made money. We can make money too. Well, they made money off of that alone because it's their Godzilla stuff, mm -hmm. their franchise. But some people out there are saying, oh, good, they'll finally make a real Godzilla because mm -hmm. I hated 2014's Godzilla. I love 2014 Godzilla. He I, was 
like such a, a sweet, caring individual. I really like the two, but they have to realize that if 2014's Godzilla wasn't as big a success as it was, we wouldn't be having this reboot from Toho that they're so expecting. Mm-hmm. So in a way, you you kind of owe the 2014 Godzilla something for them making this. And I think it's great. I, I think having both franchises exist gives everyone an option. And if you like Godzilla like we do, we're just going to end up watching both anyway. Oh, absolutely. So this will make Godzilla's 28th film since it all started back in 1954. The question is, will they put someone in a suit like they did the classic movies? Or will they go the 2014 route and do a full CG oh, Godzilla? I don't know. If they put him in a suit, though, he needs to do that dance from the movie with Monster Zero on the moon. <laughs> on the moon, That's yes. That's all I want. <laughs> and there still needs to be a man going, Gojira. That has to be in every movie. I demand it. I'm just curious as to who the first villain will be for Toho's Godzilla film. Monster Zero. That should be everybody's first villain. Could be Monster Zero. Could be a whole new monster. Could be Mothra. You want King Caesar. Of course I want King Caesar. (laughs) So they can have a 10 minute song to wake him up. Yeah. (laughs) Godzilla, stay alive. King Caesar's coming. Just give us another eight minutes. We're still singing to him. (laughs) So on to some television news. A prequel TV show to the standard Superman story is in the works from sci-fi. David Goyer, who wrote The Dark Knight, and Once Upon a Time's Ian Goldberg will be writing the pilot to Krypton. Amazing! I'm really, really excited for this. So the synopsis is, Years before the Superman legend we know, the House of El was shamed and ostracized. This series follows the Man of Steel's grandfather as he brings hope and equality to Krypton, turning a planet in disarray into one worthy of giving birth to the greatest superhero ever known. This is a fucking amazing synopsis. Like, who thinks these things up? This is like fan fiction on crack, and I'm loving it. They have enough room to make completely new original oh, characters yeah. uh, for the TV show because they're going uh, far far enough back where, one, they can make several seasons of this because mm-hmm. it's Superman's grandfather. They can really, if, if they wanted to, they can continue it into Superman's dad's life and so on and maybe eventually end with the destruction of Krypton. Cool. But I think this could be a lot of fun. I absolutely agree. One thing I would love to see from this is... Yeah, have Jor-El in there also, but we're getting to see how his morals and his vision for Krypton is instilled in him, even from his grandfather. Mm -hmm. Because all the things that he did to save his son to continue his race had to be instilled in him from somewhere. So we're getting to see everything from the beginning. Like, I'm so excited, so excited for this. And watch it just flops, but... (laughs) (laughs) It is on sci-fi. I I mean, (laughs) it it has, like, so much potential. Oh, I hope it's good. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully it's done right. We also have some Aquaman news. Jason Momoa has been signed on to play Aquaman in four movies. The movies include Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, Aquaman, and Justice League's Part 1 and 2. Seems like old news, but this is confirmation that Aquaman will be in mm-hmm. both Justice League movies, not just a cameo in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. And he's kind of locked on for that role of Aquaman. Once they finish this first string of movies, and if they decide to go and go ahead and do like Justice League Part 3 in the future, Aquaman 2, and all the other sequels, that's probably when they'll negotiate, negotiate another contract. But for now, it looks like everyone is s- still and ready to fill out all these movies and get them out hopefully hopefully i mean it all turns out really good it seems like they're putting together a great cast moving on with some dc comic news dc has announced the variant theme for the month of march which is movie poster variants you can see the full list and covers on newsarama.com but here are a few of the highlights yeah, we were at the shop, pulled it up on the article. I was like, holy shit, what is this? <laughs> Magic Mike with the Justice League? Is yeah. this like a joke? And then I saw the rest of the variants. I'm like, holy shit, these are beautiful. <laughs> Check them out on newsarama.com right now. Pull it up. Our favorites are as follows, but there are 22 covers, so there's more than just these. The first one is Batgirl number 40 by Cliff Chang. It is actually a reference to Purple Rain. So it's got her on the motorcycle. <laughs> Purple Rain. <laughs> Batman number 40 by Dave Johnson is The Mask. 
has the Joker as Jim Carrey's <laughs> The Mask. <laughs> it's awesome. I love it. Also, Batman and Robin number 40 by Tommy Lee Edwards. It is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> this one's great. I was looking at it for a second. I'm like, I recognize this, but I don't know from what. <laughs> but very, very iconic movie poster. Great to see it here. Catwoman number 40 by Dave Johnson is The Bullet. Beautiful poster as mm -hmm. well. I really like it. Next is Flash number 40 by Bill Sinkowitz. It's North by Northwest. <laughs> the Flash running away. It's really funny. That's a good movie. If you ever take a film class, guys, you'll watch it. Multiple times, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Harley Quinn number 16 by Dave Johnson is Jailhouse Rock. Getting it. Oh, anything Harley, please. Green Lantern number 40 by Tony Harris is actually a reference to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Justice League Dark number 40 by Joe Quinones is Beetlejuice. It's my favorite Dead Man cover of all time <laughs> is this Beetlejuice movie poster reference. And finally, the last one we want to touch up on is Superman Wonder Woman number 17 by Jin Ha. And it is a reference to Gone <laughs> with the Wind. Is uh, Superman Scarlet? <laughs> <laughs> He's not in that position, but he should be. He should be Scarlet. Um, where's Magic Mike on here, sir? I'm not putting that on but there. But Magic, Magic Mike, shirtless Batman. It's not for me. <laughs> it's but shirtless Batman. No. And then Superman mm -hmm. looking like over in his direction, like, hey, what's your name? See, shirtless Batman. To me, Batman is hairy as hell. He's he doesn't sh you know shave his chest or anything like that. I like the Neil Adams Batman, where he's fighting Rachel Gould shirtless and he's just hairy. No, that is fucking Batman. No, I like clean shaven Batman. I don't. I don't like to think that he but... would like take the time. Like, well, you know, not time just... time to shave the chest. No, I don't. I don't he probably see that. just waxes. He, he's that's probably, even worse. No, he probably went and laser hair removed everything, so he just didn't have to worry about it and save time in the long run. Save time from what? Like, what's he like shaving? Why is he? Why would he want to shave in the first place? Because wind resistance. No, that's what the suit just, is for. I don't even, ladies. There's a magic mic <laughs> with Batman on it. <laughs> I haven't seen people this excited for DC's variants yet. Like, a lot of people are saying this is the best theme really? so far for any variants. Like, it yeah. is kind of a big deal. Uh, people, there's all kinds of movies there from all ages, from different time periods that different people can relate to. So there's modern stuff like Magic Mike. You got Free Willy. The Matrix is one of the references. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just so many things that someone can pick out and say, yes, this is great. I love it. We picked out, like, ten of them. I think they're going to do really well for comic shops everywhere. The reasons were broke. <laughs> also revealed today, the next line of action figures from Batman the Animated Series. <laughs> More reasons were broke. Yes, but I only plan on getting one of these. Yes, so they have revealed from seasons one through three, Batman, Riddler, and Penguin. And from the new Batman adventures, the design for Batgirl. Mm -hmm. These are priced at twenty four ninety nine each, available beginning in July. These figures are totally worth it, guys. They're really cool. I mean, if you've seen our unboxing for the Batman, you see all the different gadgets and hands and all the stuff that it comes with. For twenty four ninety nine, it's well worth it. I'm excited for Batman because that is my favorite version of Batman ever. Live action, cartoon, comic, anything. It's that big bulky Batman <laughs> with the yellow symbol mm -hmm. and the cowl and Kevin Conroy's early whispery voice. <laughs> Harvey, no. That is my favorite Batman. That is the Batman. And I was so happy that they brought out another version of Batman. So now I have the Bruce Tim season four one and then the early Bruce Tim, like the more space ghost version of it. You do realize that they knew that everyone's favorite was season one through three. So they brought out season four because people were going to buy it anyway. <laughs> and then they go and let me squeeze another 25 bucks out of you with this other one. <laughs> and like, we all fell for it. They pulled a Super Smash Brothers. Yeah, they did. They know what they're doing. And I went, yeah, here you go. 25 they bucks. They ain't no fools. Nope, not at all. <laughs> but I will be passing on the Riddler and the Penguin. You know, I, just, I have to restrict myself and <laughs> get Batman. <laughs> I want him to bring out the Harley Quinn, the early version of it. Oh, no. And then just, it's almost the exact same thing, because he barely redesigned her when season I, four I came about. I would still rebuy her. Yeah. Absolutely. Rebought. Done. And that will do it for our news this week. Before we move into comic book reviews, here's our Audible audiobook recommendation for this week. The book is The Simpsons and Their Mathematical Secrets. 
Simon Singh offers this fascinating new insight into the celebrated television series The Simpsons that the show drip feeds morsels of number theory into the mind of its viewers. There are so many mathematical references in the show and in its sister program Futurama that they could form the basis of an entire universe of courses. That's crazy. I think this guy's out his mind. I never watched Simpsons and they go, hmm, math. <laughs> But you can read this book and check it out for yourself. Just go to audibletrial.com slash nerdupmedia. You don't even read it. Someone reads it for you. Like, it goes straight into your ears and into your brain. <laughs> All of you math nuts, I think you're insane. Math was my worst subject, but I know you're out there. I know there's a broke head out there that's like, oh, yeah, he's, he's right now calculating all of the bullet points and news stories that we give out during all of these podcasts, and, and he's putting together a number theory, the reasons I'm broke number theory. <laughs> do, do I need to get you that shirt that says another day and I still haven't used algebra? Yes, you do. <laughs> Although I, I was never that kid that was like, I'm never going to use this. What do I need to use this for? Because you need it for the fucking test that's coming yeah, up. Yeah, but I did like calculus, and I'm pretty sure I didn't even use that for the test. Uh, you did. I'm, I know. If anything, for the final. Because you know they would sneak in those fucking three questions. Well, I will tell you about my high school experience later. I don't want to influence <laughs> children on the podcast. But this audiobook is free with your trial when you sign up. Only at audibletrial.com slash nerdupmedia. Mm -hmm. Brokettes get a free audiobook download of their choice along with a 30-day free trial. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash nerdupmedia. Now we can move on to our stack of books, starting with indie, moving into Marvel, and finishing off with DC. First up, we have Bravest Warriors, number 27. This is written by Kate Leth with art by Ian McGinty, and the colorist is Lisa Moore. In this, ver in this comic, they have new weapons, new giant robots that they can use. Jaegers. Yeah, essentially they're Jaegers, yes. but they're also sort of like Power Rangers, because in the end, power they do Jaegers. give you... <laughs> Jaeger Rangers. The brave Power Jaegers. Jaegers. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do give them the super ultra Jaeger Ranger, Mighty Morphin Jaeger Ranger. Right, and they hint at that at the very end. Mm -hmm. And then the backup story has Wallow and a more relationship with that, that robot thing his in his arm hand. I don't know what that thing, is. I don't, he goes to Praying Mantis Prom, which I thought was so badass. Yeah. <laughs> I really wanted to go to Praying Mantis Prom. Yeah, I like this. It's definitely more on the upswing now, Bravest Warriors, as far as the comic goes. Yes, this book was definitely a filler, but I will say the side notes made it for me. They, we have a reference to The Room on the very first page. <laughs> Considered by many to be the worst movie of all time. It's, it's a pretty bad movie. I, I can't say I've ever felt empty leaving a movie, but I felt empty. <laughs> but I, I did a double take when I opened this comic because, I don't know, things happen. And then at the bottom, there's a, <laughs> a little comment that says, oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> Which, <laughs> where did this come from? <laughs> And, and I loved it. And mm -hmm. then later, there's a character that goes first things first. And the comment is, I'm the realist. And I went, Icky Azalea, what are you doing in this book? <laughs> loved it. Just for, like that, those two comments made this book for me. Awesome. Next was Hexed Number 5, written by Michael Allen Nelson, art by Dan Mora, and colors by Gabriel Casada. This issue begins a new arc. We just finished one where she killed her old boyfriend which she should have been with, but I guess that just didn't happen. So we're starting a new arc where our main character is running around with the intern. Mm -hmm. Like her new partner yeah. and what she's training. Yeah. yeah, picking up all these lost artifacts that have been re-released back into the world. Yeah, and, they're, and her intern is actually discovering how to use her powers and how to stay control of it all. And then we're learning a little bit more about why how Lucifer is bound to what she actually has to do every single day. Mm -hmm. So it was a very nice uh, insight into the characters. So I, I really like number five. Yes, yes. I really, really enjoyed this issue. It's setting up new characters. We're getting to learn more about everybody. The plot's going to thicken real fast. Our next book is Samurai Jack number 15. This is written by Jim Zub with art by Andy Suriano. And the colorist is Chris Burcham. This one is actually going to be my pass of the week. Um... I mean, it was a big old filler. Yeah, more so than Bravest Warriors. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like I... I didn't really laugh during this Samurai Jack. Well, I, didn't I feel... never laughed during Samurai Jack. I laughed when they were... When he turned into a lady. Well, <laughs> that's a little bit different. Samurai Jacqueline. 
But I just wasn't as fulfilled. Like, this is the story in which he... How he gets the blade back after it was destroyed. And I didn't really buy the the whole thing. Just You didn't buy this? What is this? The, his arm coming out of his chest? Yeah, no, it, it was just weird. It, well, I mean, it could have... I liked when Aku turned into, like, butterfly faces and flew away. And, he, you know, he gave Samurai Jack a challenge. But I just... I, I guess the message went over my head on it. <sighs> I don't know. I mean, it was the end to an arc. This The thing about this comic is I really wanted it to finish the show. And the first arc was great. And they kind of... I won't say they've been struggling because I still haven't hated them. But I, I feel like I'm ready for you just to finish it. I just... It's been years, guys. Mm -hmm. I think I was, like, not alive when this show started. <laughs> <laughs> Next is Sex Criminals number 9, written by Matt Fraction, art by Chip Zdarsky. I feel like this comic took like a complete 180 from where we were with the last one. The last one, I f didn't it come out a couple of months ago? Like there was a <sighs> short break. I, I feel like it's been a while. Between eight yes. and nine. That, I think that's why they chose to introduce a brand new character in this and then kind of give you a roundabout way of bringing the old characters that we are familiar with in, into contact with this new character. And I felt that was a smart way to bring readers back into the comic mm -hmm. after they did take that short break. So I, I thought it was really well paced. I thought it was really funny, especially with all of the like fake pornos that they <laughs> all that the she porno had started. Names, yes. It's great. And then like I always say, every every time this book comes out, it's worth it just for the <laughs> letters that people bring in. On a related note, if you do like just the letters, they did bring out a little hard cover. It's called Just the Tips. <laughs> it's the best printed letters and then brand new material. I think That's it's twelve ninety nine. It's worth really it. small. Really funny. Great gag gift for Christmas. <laughs> Give it to somebody you love. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our next issue is Teen Dog number four. This is written and drawn by Jake Lawrence. You can only say that this book is great so many times. <laughs> it's consistent. It's it's funny. The art is great. It is a limited series. We're halfway done with it at this point. Number four of eight. And I am tweeting still to Boom and Jake Lawrence saying, hey, what do we need to do to make this an ongoing series? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, none, none, of, none of these issues so far have been weak. Like, they've still been great. New characters are coming about. And this connects a new arc with what's going to happen in number five. Mm -hmm. um, number five, there will be a Battle of the Bands. If you missed all those signs in the background that said Battle of the Bands next month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I absolutely agree. It's still such a fun book. Teen Dog is hilarious. Hilarious. There's also a new book called the Boom Box Mixtape. It's coming out this month. It's going to have a bunch of original material, uh, short stories by the crew at Lumberjanes, Teen Dog, Cyanide and Happiness, The Midas Flesh, and the even a first ever Munchkin comic. Awesome. I do like Cyanide and Happiness. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Next is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 41, written by Tom Waltz, Bobby Curnow, and Kevin Eastman, with art by Corey Smith and colors by Rhonda Patterson. Donatello just needs to, like, chill out a little bit, not be doing this dangerous stuff with his little wheelie turtle thing. No, Donatello is taking care of business because they none of the other turtles want to. He is like Batman is to the Justice League. That's what he okay. is to the rest of the Turtles. Okay, Donatello's as good as Batman. No, I'm not saying he's as good as Batman. I'm saying he's as separated from the Turtles, his brothers at this moment, as Batman is from the rest of the Justice League. I don't buy it. I think what he's doing is risky. I think he's going to put everybody at risk, and there's going to be cray-cray problems. What is the bigger problem here between the two? You have the Technodrome that's, that can destroy the entire world, and that's run by Krang, or the Shredder and his team of ninjas that are more of a local problem with the city. There's going to be cray-cray problems, <laughs> and he just needs to chill out and not be trying to be BFFs with Shredder. He's doing the right thing. He's being BFFs with Shredder. He's merging... He rolled in there with his little turtle thing, and he's like, Metalhead. yo, Shredder, yo, Shredder, you want to get some tea later? And Shredder's like, sure, let's be BFFs and fight the Krang. And he's like, okay, forgets my brothers. They'll fight the Krang together, defeat the bigger threat, and then they can worry about Shredder later. And I still, I have so much anxiety in this moment. <laughs> Donatello is making me anxious and he should probably stop that. I, I loved it. I thought it was a great mm, issue. It was a great issue, but I'm, I'm anxiety. <laughs> what about, what about Mikey? What's going to happen to Mikey? He'll come around too. 
Next up is The Amazing Spider-Man number 11. This is written by Dan Slott with art by Oliver Koipel and the colorist is Justin Ponsor. The struggle between Peter Parker and the superior Spider-Man is settled in this issue. Who is going to be the leader of the entire Spider-Gang? On one side you have one Spider-Man who wants to go directly after all of these vampire people that are killing off the Spider-Man. Yeah, vampires. And the and then there's another Spider-Man who's like, no, we need to f run away, figure out a plan to actually get into their world and disable all of this and figure out who they are and where they come from. And that's all settled. Obviously, one is Superior Spider-Man, the more aggressive of the two, and then Peter Parker. The interaction between those two was awesome. I, mm -hmm. felt, I felt like it wasn't out of character for Otto, what ended up happening for him to figure out what would be the the best route for not only himself but for the rest of the team as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. i agree it was a great issue there was a lot of jumping around but i never felt lost we're getting to see all these different spider-men and they highlight them and accentuate them each mm -hmm. which i think is great um i didn't realize we had a cartoon spider-man in there yeah that was that's which, the ultimate spider-man yeah, yeah, cartoon yeah. it's so much fun i was so happy to see that we get to see old cartoon spider-man 2 mm -hmm. which i enjoy seeing overall this book tells a great story but it's a lot of fun also yeah and you can read it yourself first broquette that heads on over to marvel.com slash redeem enter in the following code and read it for yourself let us know what you think n t m five seven k b two k a e s Final Marvel book this week is Thor number three, written by Jason Aaron, art by Russell Dodderman, and colors by Matthew Wilson. I still hope this is Mama Thor because that would be so cool, but I'm starting to think maybe it isn't Mama Thor. They keep teasing the reader with about, they're about to reveal who it is, and then they pull it right back. And it's smart of them because a lot of the customers that I'm seeing picking up this book are reading it just to see, like, who is this new Thor? We mm -hmm. want to find out. And if they tell you from the beginning, I don't, I don't feel like readers are actually going to stay on. I agree. This is getting, like, there's so much going on in here, though. We're fighting ice giants and evil elves. And now this minotaur guy. Mm -hmm. And Lady Thor is so much fun to see. We get a great reveal at the end, so who knows what's going to go down. Tons of action. If you love action in your comics, definitely pick up Thor number three. Our first of our DC books is Batgirl number 37. This is written by Cameron Stewart and Brendan Fletcher, with art by Babs Tarr, and the colorist is Morris Wicks. This is the issue that has the imposter Batgirl, the one that we learned about in number 36, and how she is sort of messing up Batgirl's life in this brand new city, and she really wants to put a stop to it in a world in which she actually uses social media to round out the people and to calm them down and get them on the side of justice here we have someone else that also uses the same type of media but to paint her in the worst light possible and you see how she has to deal with getting rid of this fake person and and kind of clear her name with the rest of the people mm -hmm. i thought it was a great issue there's a lot of suspense the reveal to who the bat girl was was <laughs> fabulous yes it was absolutely fabulous but it also leads way to an even bigger threat Yeah, that I'm so excited to see Discover in the upcoming issues. And another love interest. She's just getting it from all over the place. Good for her. She is. And the artwork, I felt like it's it hasn't been better. Like it's It just keeps getting better and mm -hmm. better. And so far, this is the best one so far by Babs Tar. I loved it. Back row number 37 is my pick of the week. Really? Your pick of the week. It is a great book. Absolutely. Not my pick of the week, though. Last book this week is Harley Quinn Holiday Special Number 1, written by Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti, art by Darwin Cook, Morissette, and Brand Peters, and colors by Paul Mounts and Dave Stewart. This one's my pick of the week. This one came in two covers. You had the Holiday Special cover, and then the New Year's Eve Special. Exact same price, $4.99, but you get tons of pages. We bought both. <laughs> of course we did. <laughs> So that most of the subscribers that had Harley Quinn down as their on their book, they go, yeah, just just give me the other cover as well. <laughs> it's just ugh. Harley they just Quinn sign over their paycheck to you, like ugh, Harley Quinn. It's a it's an illness. Like we just have to get both covers. <laughs> but she's so fabulous. 
and it's so easy to upsell too because i'm like it's cover price like it's not a higher price variant They're like yeah just give me that <laughs> just they, do they sound that defeated when they ask usually me? but just, ugh, but yeah. i pick them up and i go yeah i got it too like <laughs> so we can both be defeated together <laughs> So this is the closest thing we've had to, like, the number zero issue, mm-hmm. because mainly Darwin Cook did oh. come back. Oh, Darwin Cook. This is why it's my pick, is the backup story with Darwin Cook's art, and she she has her horns. She has the hat with her horns and her little Santa costume, and it's the best I've seen Harley look in such a long time that it brought tears to my eyes, and I was just, it just made me so happy. It was very cool. Every time they do Harley Quinn in different styles, different artists, I'm, it's just a feast for the eyes. Uh, the first story I felt was the weakest. It was also the longest, mm-hmm. but it was definitely very much like a Bruce Tim sort of story in which it's just really wacky how she interacts with the child. And... Yes, it is wacky. What I liked about it was at the end of the day, she did something good. Mm-hmm. And you got to see, I love the therapist side of Harley. And you got to see that peek out just a little bit. Like, she did it for her own selfish reasons. But in the end, she did good and people are better for it. So I did appreciate that story. And she was giving out puppies. Like, she could put a puppy in my bag, no problem. (laughs) Yeah, my favorite story was that Darwin Cook one, which Mm -hmm. is the third one in the book. The art is amazing. And it's just, like, what happens when Harley Quinn is face-to-face with aging? Mm -hmm. Like, she gets her first gray hair and you see her freak out. It's so funny. I loved it. Oh, it was so much fun. It was such a great ride. I could see it as an episode. Yeah. And it would just be fabulous. Cracked me up. This is why this is my pick of the week. Yeah, very good choice. There's even references to Paul Dini if you pay attention to the backgrounds. I mean, it's a little obvious, but it's great. Like it's, <laughs> the bag says Deanies, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the bags. It's on the buildings like three times. And I, I was like, yeah, awesome. Paul Dini. <laughs> Give him his credit. <laughs> Give him money for this shit. He deserves it. So to summarize this week, my pick of the week was Batgirl number 37. My pick of the week was Harley Quinn Holiday Special number one. My pass of the week was Samurai Jack number 15. And I don't think I had a pass of this week. Awesome. The last couple things we wanted to cover are there's three action figures that came out this week as well. The new Batman Adventures versions of Mr. Freeze and Two-Face, $24.95 each. Worth it. In the same line of those DC collectibles with the Batman the Animated Series. And also the new 52 Thrasher suit deluxe Batman action figure. This is priced at $39.99, but it is amazing. It is really cool. I got to play with one. You can actually move the fingers separately. It's so intricate. It's solid. It's got some weight to it. You can put the mask on them. So every man who buys them, Batman has the middle finger. (laughs) I did do that. And yes, I snapped a picture, which I will be putting up on Twitter eventually. (laughs) It is a damn cool figure. I loved it. And it actually feels like it is manufactured a little bit better than the Batman the Animated Series ones. The designs lends itself better to that kind of plastic. And it also feels like if you were to play with it, like if, if you give it to a kid to, you know, do some regular heavy play, it won't break easily. That's what I like the best about it. That's awesome. Great stuff for the holidays right around the corner. Right. <laughs> the only thing, I do want to see the Mr. Freeze from the original seasons with the purple mm-hmm. shoulder pads and maybe a little fro- more frosting on the helmet would have been really nice. I know on the front they probably didn't want to do that, so you can actually see what the figure head looks like, but maybe put some frosting on the back or some more at the top. I felt that would have been cool, but maybe for the next time they do Mr. Freeze, and if they do the original design, perfect. Give it, like, do a little Nora glass piece as an accessory. That would be great. That'd be perfect. That'd be amazing. (laughs) But that will actually do it for our podcast this week. Thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Reasons I'm Broke or on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Reasons I'm Broke. If you guys head on over to nerdupmedia.com, you can look and see everywhere we are. We're also on iTunes. If you listen to us through there, please leave a comment, a rating, or review. It helps other people find us. Also, if you head on over to nerdupmedia.com, click on the shop, you can actually buy some Nerd Up Media shirts. We offer them in gray, blue, red, and black. Mm-hmm. For just a donation of sixteen ninety nine, you get the shirt. It comes in a variety of different sizes for men and women. This covers your shipping and your shirt, and it's mailed with love. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all so much for listening. I'm Daniel. And I'm Kelly. We'll see you next week.